Hey. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't know. I mean, I would. One time, it was sick. I had a kid off. <laughs> Got a kid out. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We are here today with Corey White. Dating in this Me Too era, though, fucking hell. I went on a date with this girl the other night and bought her a drink and came back to the table and she said, you didn't spark that, did you? And I was shocked. I was like, I hate to be the one to break this to you, but there is fucking no chance <laughs> that I would waste the schedule like pharmaceutical <laughs> on you. Okay? <laughs> Like, don't flatter yourself. If anyone's getting Bill Cosby here, it's me, all right? Ladies and gentlemen, we're here today once again with Corey White. Hello, mate. How are you? Good, brother. How are you? Splendid, splendid. So, uh, they missed the first take because the mic uh, went out, but you've been playing chess, been yeah, playing your guitar. Playing my guitar, doing my washing, uh, going into my uh, Anders Brevik phase. Anders Brevik? Who's that? Am I too young? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Uh, showing my age there. <laughs> Who he is he? What did he do? Oh, look. He <laughs> Maybe we should start this again. I don't think <laughs> I can have <laughs> this graphic material on the internet. No. <laughs> who is he? Oh, he was the, the photogenic white terrorist in Norway who <laughs> thought he'd make a political point by trying to wipe out the next generation of the Labor Party. <laughs> Only you, Corey. <laughs> nice. So... <laughs> <laughs> He's an esoteric cleric, and they worried he might be Anders Brevik. There you go. So, oh, no. have you been up to anything interesting since we last chatted? Obviously, plotting mass shootings yeah. and the like. But uh, no, mate, just gigging, writing, trying to organise the second half of the year, and mm. planning for festivals next year and such. Uh, trying to improve my forward planning. Oh, nice. I'm not very good at uh, you know that. So it's a deficiency I'm trying to address in my life. Okay, being more prepared and planning things out? Yes. Oh, nice. Minimising my tax. <laughs> For those that don't know, what festivals are you at? Uh, well, I've just been to the, the Fringe Festival in Adelaide and uh, Melbourne Comedy Festival. Nice. Did it go uh, well? Yeah, no, it was really good, mate. Uh, exceeded all my expectations. Um, so, yeah, look, there's a big pendulum shift going on, I think, culturally okay. around the world. I think the last time we spoke was January 2020. Two? Yeah. I think it was the week before, it was February, it was the week before the mandates kicked in and I wasn't allowed in anywhere without uh, the passport or the vaccine. <laughs> so yeah. bits happened since then. Um, Do you want to go in, uh, into that a little bit? Yeah, why not? Know? Because that's been a wild ride and comedy has been a really sort of pivotal aspect of it, especially at the beginning. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the mashup of Matt or for Leah's, but... Uh, it's a compilation of what all the late night show hosts and comedians around the world were saying, like the Trevor Noahs, Jimmy Kimmel's, mm. uh, even the Australian contingent, you know, they were on board and uh, mocking people who had different views or wanted to ask questions or do their own research, so mm. to speak. Uh, and it was quite vicious. And you remember what it was like in here when uh, how polarising that climate was. Uh, and looking back on it, like, I, I'm so grateful for it and grateful for the footage. It was... I don't think a moment that in time that'll ever come again as a, for me as a comedian. Mm. Um, yeah, but now um, that tribe have certainly got nothing to say about it and <laughs> it's come out with all the Facebook files and the Twitter files that uh, the censorship apparatus, the digital censorship apparatus with the tech companies and the relationship mm. with the American government, they were targeting political satire and jokes because, uh, you know, good political satire... Uh, joins dots, you know, addre addresses contradictions, hypocrisies, mm. and can alter people's reality. And, you know, great satire comes from a place of passion. And during that time, I was passionate You're about... You're very passionate. Um, some people say I was unhinged. And look, <laughs> I don't know if I was unhinged or I was having a sane reaction to an insane society. I think the truth is somewhere in the middle because, you know, mm. these issues aren't black and white, as you know. Uh, mm. So a bit of a non-binary thinker in that regard. But... Uh, it's good that you stuck to your guns, though. Well, yes. look, in, in my view, I've been emphatically vindicated. Mm. Um, and it's the question no one wants to uh, talk about, or issue no one wants to talk about. Uh, and it's fascinating to see when I talk about it in here, once an audience likes me and they trust me, and then I bring up that issue. It's, uh, yeah. it's very interesting to watch. So uh, it's been a journey. Someone, there's a great documentary to be made about that. And the role uh, comedy plays, I think, in a, in a liberal democracy as a form of cultural and social mediation yeah. of sorts. Because <coughs> uh, I say, in the closing of my show, when I just wrote that um, I think comedy is the most pure form of democracy. 
Mm. Uh, beca- and because you can't control how you vote, laughter is an involuntary response, and mm. that's why younger women particularly have an issue with me sometimes because I got that mind virus, the frontal lobe herpes, the military <laughs> industrial simplex, um, and they're angered and amused at the same time, and the coexistence of those emotions, uh, they don't know how to deal with it sometimes. So yeah, look, I I, I love it, and um, yeah, ultimately I think great satire is uh, really important in a free society. Mm. No, for sure, for sure. Um, I mean, you you can take that back. Jeez, to we covered some ground. Started off with like terrorists, yeah, or well, terrorists? extremists, because I'm white. Obviously, <laughs> I mean, if you did that, you'd be a terrorist. Domestic terrorist. But uh, yeah. yeah, well, has that's you know, um, but that was wild to be. You know, they were calling us urban terrorists, and you know, um, we were going to kill everyone's nana. Uh, and I'll never forget what happened one night in here. Shin brought me on. Um, he said, oh, I was downstairs, remember? You filmed it and we projected it onto the screen yeah. because I couldn't come <laughs> into the gong show. <laughs> and Shin brought me on and said, this guy can't come in because he's unvaccinated. And the whole crowd was like, boo! And it was vicious. It was, it was hectic. It was vicious and I'll never forget it. And one of the other moments I remember um, from that festival, not long after we spoke in that first interview, I did this gig and I was getting in on the fake vaccine passport. Um, and I was just pretending I was one of them and I was, you know, doing very well. I had the crowd in the palm of my hand and I just said off the cuff that, you know, I hope the virus kills all those unvaccinated scum, the fucking vermin that they are. <laughs> and this crowd went up in laughter and applause and my heart sank because in the moment I knew, like I knew. That was you. That I could be Hitler. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like the right <laughs> amount of, that's just open mic in Bavaria. You know, don't worry about a failed artist with a moustache. You need to worry about a failed comedian with a beard. Um... Jeez, Corey, why do people think you have fascist undertones? Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> I couldn't put a yeah, I couldn't put a finger on. It. I used to work for the Greens. <laughs> do you, um do you think that that time period's taken a big shape on your comedy though? Uh, yes it's almost and no. Attached yes to and you no. I mean, I think my comedy was always anti-establishment oh, and sure. provo- provocative. Um, but I was just um, there were so many good reasons to oppose it. Or I have. Uh, questions asked and the censorship is an anathema to comedy and mm. the walls of censorship are closing in and the comedians don't seem to care about it. No. It's like the the lawyers with the rule of law and uh, free open trials, mm. uh, secret trials. Lawyers don't seem to care. And Orwell had the same uh, um, observation in the 1940s about the sort of writers of his time mm. that, you know... Um, they didn't seem to care about the principles that should mean the most to them. Mm. And the art won't survive if your principles don't survive with it. Yeah, for sure. So, George Orwell, you mean? Yeah, yeah. well, that, that was the point he was making about yeah. art. And he said, you know, that poetry would probably be the only art that would survive in the totalitarian societies of the future. Poetry? Mm-hmm. Oh, why did he say that? Uh, I can't remember the exact way. Uh, but he said because you could write poetry in a way that was cryptic enough that everyone still knew what you meant. Okay. You could be more creative with poetry. Mm. Um, so, and, and I think, but also the other end of that is censorship makes better writers. I think if you have to navigate the censorship, it, uh, yeah, it's it's ironic. What do you mean? It, ma- it makes well. I mean, writers. the Soviet comedians, you know, like they had to be very, very clever with their writing mm. to be able to get around the official censorship. Oh, and okay. In countries yep. where you know you can't speak freely, Yeah, uh, I think it does make for a more creative or a different angle to take it at. Yeah, yeah, okay, I get you. So, so like, limiting the expression Obviously, it's not a allowed. good thing, but, you know, I mm. think it does improve people's writing skills when you can't address certain things. Yeah, yeah, for you sure. You to address it in a different way. And it, all, it almost makes it cooler, right? It's like ha- uncoding the anagram, like... Yeah. Um, what's that, World War Two, where they try to undo the, the code? Enigma. Yeah, enigma. That's a good one. Doesn't that mean mystery? Uh, yes, I think so. Enigmatic, yeah. Enigmatic, yeah. Enigma. <laughs> <laughs> so my one laugh in yeah, the room, fucking A. <laughs> does it not mean mystery? I don't know. What does it mean? You don't know who's going to turn up on any given day. You don't know who's going to turn up. The unpredictability. Oh. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) All right. Nice. Okay. Mysterious. There we go. There you go. Such confidence with the laugh. (laughs) Oh, nice. 
So, moving on. <laughs> now that I've been vindicated again by Merriam <laughs> yeah. Webster. Th- yeah. Thanks, mate. <laughs> thanks, Durkin. Do you have... um? So, do you have any plans with your comedy coming up now? Are there new goals that you're trying to achieve? Are you working on a new hour? Yeah, look, I'm trying to just get this hour recorded. I was booked to uh, have it all recorded in Melbourne and booked the flights, booked the camera operators, and then three days later, the venue fucking went under. Fuck. <laughs> so, True. I'm supposed to be filming a special in Melbourne in uh, three weeks' time, and I've got no venue. So, uh, up so shit creek without a venue, as I'd say. Oh, no, you could do a straight thing. Not in Melbourne, mate. It's too fucking cold and rainy, oh, and I yeah. like to be inside. So are you still going to do the special? Uh, not with that venue. Well, yeah, obviously yeah. not with that venue. But, but look, if I can get a venue, I will, because um, I did it last weekend, and uh, I had the Chief Justice and his wife in the second row. Yeah, okay. With a bunch of other judges, which was... Uh, and they liked they liked. Yeah, no, about. they're very complimentary, yeah, and it was um, that must be quite a- surreal. Well, it must be, be a massive compliment, right? Yeah, no, it, it was. I, I was very flattered by his attendance and, uh, yeah, he loves comedy. He quoted Mitch Hedberg in one of his most recent judgments. Okay, who's he's Mitch Hedberg? Uh, he's an American comedian from okay, okay. Uh, 80s and 90s. So, oh, nice. Uh, did Hedberg kill himself or was it a drug overdose? Heroin overdose. Oh, like he was a, a real artist. Comedy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a real artist. Yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah, that's been my life at the moment, mate, and just trying to uh, expand into the East Coast market because mm. I was very successful in Adelaide and Melbourne. So I think Queensland is where I'll uh, be able to, you know, make a big dent. Do you think it's because they're more politically, like, motivated? No, I think because they're more redneck. They're more redneck. Oh, Western no. Australia and Queensland, both the most redneck states. Okay. In my view. Oh, okay, nice. I have heard that a few times, yeah. It was interesting when the Native Title Act was first proposed by Paul Keating, uh, the state two states where the Labor numbers got hit the hardest was Western Australia and Queensland. Oh really? I mm. never knew that. Oh nice. You know, I saw it was funny the other day. I saw the numbers for the voice, the polling was around the states. Okay. And the state with the highest number of support uh, for the voice was Tasmania. Oh, the Was one where they killed him off? <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, what a cliffhanger. Is that the white guilt vote? Or <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But it was only 57%. So, <laughs> yes. Oh, that's slightly sad to end on. <laughs> but the, <laughs> the next question was going to be, is there anything that you want to sign off on? Uh, anything you want to say? Anything you want to promote coming up? Promote? Uh, no, I'd just like to promote people to, to be reading and be abreast of the issues of what's happening in the government's online misinformation bill that's coming up uh Mm. we're sleepwalking into totalitarianism and if we haven't uh witnessed and remembered what's just happened in the last three years Mm. uh i mean as long as you're upfront about that and you're happy to condemn your kids and your future to that as long as you're having an honest conversation Uh, and that's why i keep doing what i do because i want to be there to remind people Mm. about the things that are important uh and it's grandiose and romantic and guys like Dan think I'm a bit of a fucking wanker about that. But, you know, I, I don't mind it. You know, that's fucking, mm. that's what art's for. And uh, I'm a romantic at heart, despite <laughs> my abrasive exterior. <laughs> so, yes. Oh, cool. Well, thank you so much Believe for chatting with me it. today, Corey. Thank you for having uh, my incoherent ramblings. No, it wasn't incoherent. It was, I felt like I couldn't. Um, it was roller coaster. <laughs> it was definitely a roller coaster. Not a good one. Well, but thank anyway, you so much. It's time to get off. Thank you for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been Corey White. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great day and don't sell your kids' souls to the government.